right, Doc. Thank you for taking us back, man. I love when they take me back. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to try to tune up a little. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. But thank you for taking this back. Listen, listen. Have you ever read uh, evaluations uh, on products um, that you buy, like shoes, and you read up on the evaluations, or you're going to buy that new cell phone, you want to read up on the iPhone 8, or that new kitchen appliance. Have you ever, has anybody ever looked up the, 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 the evaluations on those things? Am I the only one that does that? All right, all right, all right. Uh, have you ever gone to a seminar? You know, you've gone to a seminar, and then uh, you've been asked to evaluate the presenter at the end of the seminar. They say, you know, would you, was he on time? Did he preach hours and hours on end? Don't be evaluating me today. Uh, ha have you ever been evaluated for work performance, like work performance, and then in hopes that when they evaluate your work performance, you get a raise? Has anybody ever been there? All right, all right. Uh, I wonder, does anybody remember, that's why I'm glad uh, Dr. O'Quinn took us back, I want to take you back, does anybody ever remember anxiety of coming home with a report card that you knew was not going to please your parents? Look at your hand out, I got some, I got some fill-ins for you. Uh, you had anxiety because you knew your poor work execution meant that there was going to be a pitiful presentation of your evaluation, which is far below your parents' expectation. Hence, you were filled with anxiety. I don't know if you've had one of those parents, or I don't know if you're one of those parents, but has anybody known a parent uh, that's ever said something like this? You bet not bring no Fs up in my house. Because you knew your behind was going to get told. Roll my video. Roll my video, Dan. See, I've been waiting to see this, especially after you said this was your best semester ever. Um, I mean, I don't remember saying all that. Your teacher just left me a message earlier today about your work, too. Something urgent about your class performance. Wait, did you make the honor roll? Uh, maybe? That's my boy. Now let's see how you did. Wait, Dad. Whose report card is this? Because I know it's not yours. Huh? Is there a problem? A pro- These grades are the problem, Kyle. What are these grades? Huh? I'm looking for an answer. Look, Dad, what happened was I- Hey, hey, I didn't ask you to speak. I don't want to hear another word from you. I mean, you spent all this time looking at the Jeezy shoes or looking at the new Supreme shirts, but you don't spend two minutes studying for your classes. You know what I don't understand the most? How you can listen to that song all day. A, 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 but not have all A's on this report card. Man, I didn't fail everything. Didn't fail? Kyle, you failed math, science, and English. How did you fail English when you speak the language? What, you forgot your ABCs or something? You know what, Dad? If you think about it, it's kind of your fault. Oh. You're the one that's always dropping me off so late to school that I miss my morning classes. Maybe if you could drop me off on time for once, I would actually get some good grades. Was well, that right? Look, Dad, I didn't mean to. You know what? I'll show you something. It's my fault. I'll show you something. Come here, boy. You know you done had them days. <laughs> It's the anxiety of bringing home a report that you have fallen short. Today, I want to use a list in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, 
beginning at verse 16, as a warning of the actions that you should avoid never getting an A for doing. In fact, it is not a do this list, but a don't do this list. But before we dig in to pray, uh, to, to consider today's title, Does God Love or Hate the Things You Do? Let's take a few minutes and let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and for your grace. I love that we are forever yours and that you will never put us out of your forever family. But you do have family expectations. You do have parameters on how we are to live our life that brings glory to you. And so I pray now that we would listen and key into what Proverbs is teaching us about what to avoid so that we don't bring home a report card full of F's. But God, that we get an A because we listen to you. Order my steps. Order my tongue. Order my words today in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, dear Doc. You are so wonderful on those keyboards, man. We could just listen to them all day. God bless you. We appreciate you. Well, we are all headed, listen to me, we are all headed for an evaluation at the end of life, both for the believer and the unbeliever, both with different types of outcomes. If you look with me in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, I have it in your handout. It'll be on your screen. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I said, we're all headed for an evaluation. Are you walking with me? It says this, and just as each person, what does it say there? Each person is destined to die. How many times? Uh-huh. And then after that comes what? That judgment is an evaluation of your, your, your actions here on the earth. 2 Corinthians 5.10 uh, brings another solidifying scripture where it says this, For we must all, some or all, which one? For we must all stand before Christ to be judged, evaluated. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you this morning to avoid seven practices found in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19, so that you will have no anxiety about the presentation of your work evaluation before your Father in heaven. Let's look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 to find these seven things that we definitely want to avoid. Here we go. It records this. It said, there are six things the Lord hates. Somebody said, hate. No, seven he detests. Verse 17, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. A believer should never want, to, want God to look at his or her life and see any of these seven things that he hates working out in our life. Beware to never get it twisted that God, we, we should never get twisted that and, and love what God hates and then hate what God loves. That's twisted. What we need to do is because those things, when we act that way, it brings shame to the family name. A wise child of God always loves what God loves and hates what God hates. Proverbs 6, 16 says, there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven he detests. So let's start going down the list. Number one, let's see what God hates. Number one on the list, God hates Haughty eyes. Somebody say haughty eyes. Another translation says that God hates a proud look. It's pride. A person who is arrogant, a person who is arrogant has haughty eyes. It's a person with haughty eyes is a person who is puffs himself up so that he can look down on others. 
It's not so much the physical eye that they're talking about. It's the outlook of life that we're talking about. They are a person who is so high, so puffed up on themselves, they, can, they have no problem bringing you down. A person stuck on themselves revoltingly expresses the attitude that it's all about me and it's never about thee. A person with haughty eyes thinks that they're better than anyone else. The conversation must always end up being about them. My ideals are always more supreme, and your ideals are always stupid. A person that's haughty is a person with a proud look, spends too much time in the mirror, praising themselves for the way they look instead of praising God for the way he made them look. Arrogance, arrogance is so anti-God because it does not what? It doesn't consider others. It doesn't consider other people's needs. It doesn't consider their values or the value that God places on them. They become a judge without qualification. You can't qualify whether somebody's looking good or somebody's not looking good, somebody's uh, the, uh, uh, worthy or somebody's unworthy. Only God knows what the standard is. We have to just trust that when God made you, he said, mm, that's good. I've got to trust that when God made you, you're good. Somebody tell your neighbor, you're good. Only because God says so, not because of my evaluation. But arrogance is so anti-God. Arrogance, let me tell you, listen to me, arrogance is satanic. That's why, that's why God hates it. It's satanic. Listen, a person with haughty eyes is full of S-I-N. A person with haughty eyes, arrogant eyes, is a person that's full of P R I. D-E. You know what the middle letter of both those words are, sin and pride? What's the middle letter of sin and pride? If you are proud, arrogant, stuck on yourself, then I want you to consider this example we're about to read found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. Listen to me, listen to me. Here it goes. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. There's a fall. Is there evidence about the fall? You have been thrown down to the earth. You who destroy the nations of the world. Verse 13, for you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will Climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, the Bible says, instead you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to the lowest depths. Can I tell you that I will get you thrown down? God hates arrogance. Isaiah chapter 43, 10, let me help you understand where, you're, where, we're really, where God is and where you are if you're, if you're struggling with arrogance. Isaiah chapter 43, 10 says, but you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been and never will be. You, do you hear what God is saying to you? So let me, let me, let me help somebody understand this. Arrogant people don't get the fact that God alone sits on his throne and there's no room for anybody else. He's God all by himself. He is the supreme one. Once you recognize that there is only one holy, only one righteous, only one worthy of glory, then you can humble yourself because you cannot measure up to him. You will never be God. God hates a proud outlook. God hates arrogant. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. If you're full of pride and you're riding on a high horse, I advise you to come down before God knocks you down. If you think you're more highly than you ought to, then, you ought, then you're going to get an F on the failure of your report card before God. Somebody says, you need to, listen, listen, somebody needs to hear me. If arrogance is in your life, you need to resist it. You need to repent of it. 
and ask God to humble you and allow, excuse me, follow God's plan to humble yourself before God humbles you. I got some questions in your handout. Question number one says, on a scale of one to ten, and these are really the ones that you can answer in growth group, but I just want to put some of them out here in public. On a scale of one to ten, how arrogant, this is your, this is your evaluation. Are you hearing me? Are you checking? Are you walking with me? On a scale of one to ten, how arrogant are you? I put a little parenthesis. I said you might want to ask somebody else because you might not be realistic with yourself. You might, you might not really get it right, so you might want to ask somebody else. And how, how, how arrogant are you on a scale of one to ten? God hates arrogance. Let's move on. But it's not too late to change your grade, though. Uh, what do you have to do? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8 gives you some insight on what you ought to do to battle some of these things. And I can't do this with every last uh, one of the seven, so we're not going to spend all time digging on a lot of the seven. But I felt this was important because you saw what happened to the son of the star. He got the son of the morning, and he um, um, got thrown down because of his arrogance. But I want to contrast that with the, with the righteous son of God, Jesus Christ. That's uh, the description of him found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8. Verse Verse 5 says, you must have the same mind, same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Uh, I'm, I'm stumbling because I've memorized this in the King James Version where it says, you've got to have the mind of Christ, right? But in this translation, it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not uh, think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the what? humble position. Are you seeing this? This is the creator of the universe. Colossians will tell you that he was there in the beginning. He created all things. All things were created for him. If anyone who had reason to boast, if anyone who had reason to breath, it's God. That sunlight that you love, that, 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 that moonlight that you enjoy, that water that you do, he made all that. He's the one can brag about it. But the Bible said he humbled himself. He humbled himself. He took on the position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in a human form, he humbled himself. Listen to me. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross just for my arrogant self. I didn't want to say your arrogant self because I don't want y'all thinking I'm a preaching. How are you going to call me arrogant from the pulpit? We on the camera and everything. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And the Bible says in due time, God will exalt you. God hates a proud look. So you need to evaluate your, your behavior. Does God love or hate the things you do? Does God love or hate the things you do? Let's go to number two. What's another thing that God hates? Number two, God hates a lying tongue. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. God hates a lying tongue. Listen to me. Uh, this is, I got this from the New Unger's Bible Dictionary. It's a definition. It said, a lie is the utterance by speech or act of what is false with intent to mislead or to delude. In Scripture, the word is used to designate all the ways in which men deny or alter the truth in word or deed as also in, in evil in general. It's speaking lie. It's telling an untruth about what you know to be true. When a believer lies, he's acting just like the deceiver. We are children of the truth, born again, born of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So any kind of lie, can I talk with you this morning? Any kind of lie, a little lie, a little white lie, a little black lie, a little harmless lie, a protective, uh, a lie to protect you from getting harmed, any kind of lie, a little lie on your tax thing, and all that, all them lies, any lie will get you an F on the report card of God. There is no such thing as a good, harmless, little, ain't going to hurt nobody lie. Let's look at John 8, 44. Jesus said this about some religious folk. I'm, I'm just trying to help you understand. God hates a lying tongue. Listen to what Jesus said in, in John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, for you, listen to him. Listen, he's talking to some religious folk. These are, these are, these are, these are people who 
went out of their way to spend time to go to worship. I mean, everybody knew when they were walking, they were going to church or to the temple to really worship. All right? Here you go. Verse 40. You are the children of your father, the devil. And you do the evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Did I tell you that when you lie, it's satanic? There is no lie ever, light, heavy, no lie ever that is worthy of coming out of the believer's mouth because the father of lies is Satan. He is not your daddy. Stop speaking his language. Well, what, what, what will happen to liars? Does God really hate, come on now, does God really hate liars? All right, let's look to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, talking about the end of times and when things will be all said and done, when, when God gets rid of all evil and wickedness and all these things. Let's read what it says in Revelation 21, 8. Did I say that God likes, uh, God hates a lying tongue? Did, did, I, did I say that already? Yeah, all right. Revelation 21, 8. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immortal, those who practice witchcraft, witchcraft, I don't worship it. That's a big list, isn't it? That's a scary list. That's a, that's a foul list. You'd be like, yep, they need to be. Yep, cowards, yep, unbelievers, yep, murderers, yep, immoral, yep, I don't worship it. And then it says this, and all what? The liars get lumped in with the immoral. The liars get lumped in with the witchcraft. The liars get lumped in with the murderers. They said their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. When we as Christians lie, we, mis we misrepresent the truth. You are not supposed to look like the devil. You're supposed to look like Jesus, the one to whom the, it was said, I find no fault in him. He never spoke any untruth. Therefore, my brothers and my sister, let no lie come out of your mouth because God hates a lying tongue. Question number two. On a scale of one to ten, on a scale of one to ten, how much lying do you do in a given day? Mm -hmm. you, you might want to ask the Holy Spirit this one because, you know, you might not even know the answer. So you might want to ask the Spirit of God that one. Evaluate your behavior. Does God love or does God hate the things that you do? Let's go down the list. We're at number three. What's another thing that God hates? God hates hands that kill the innocent. Hands that kill the innocent. Well, uh, here you may, you, you may feel that you're good. You say, I definitely get an A on this one because I ain't never killed nobody. Well, not so fast, not so fast. Let's consider some words found in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. Jesus says, uh, you have heard that it is said uh, of those of old, you shall not murder. Y'all good so far? Officer, I know you can hear me out there. And so I ain't, and nobody's raising their hand that they're murdered, so we're good. Stay seated. You're good. Uh, uh, you have heard uh, that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit murder, uh -huh. but whoever, uh, whoever murders will be in danger of the judge. You kill, you go to jail. You kill, you might have to get executed. You kill, there's a price to pay. Verse 22, but I say to you, listen to what Jesus is saying. He's taking it to a whole nother level. He's up, he's ranching it up a little bit. So to help you understand, don't you get yourself a proud look saying, I ain't never killed nobody. Verse 22 said, I say unto you that whoever is angry, Lord have mercy, an angry Christian, listen, angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, while you're sitting there, be careful and let's not get hard. He said, I got a cause. Let me tell you, what cause is not forgivable? What cause is not worthy to be put under the blood of Jesus? When you're talking about a brother and a sister in Christ and you're angry and your sins has been forgiven and his sins have been forgiven and you're still angry, we've got an issue. The Bible says, Jesus told you to pray. He said, when you pray, he said, forgive us our debts as 
If you don't forgive your brother their trespasses, why in the world are you expecting God to forgive you of yours? God hates hands that kill the innocent. I put a note in there I read from the uh, Life Application. By now, you probably know that's one of my favorite study Bibles in the world. Um, I said if I was ever on an island, that's the, only, that's the only Bible I ever want is that one, my Life Application Study Bible. I love it. Uh, uh, l- listen, to, listen to an application exhortation that was taken out of that for uh, Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 22. It's in your handout. It says, killing is a terrible sin, but anger is a great sin too because it also violates God's command to love. Anger in this case refers to a seething, brooding bitterness against someone. May it never be in the church of God. May it never be in any BC. It's a dangerous emotion that always threatens to leap out of control, leading to violence, emotional hurt, increased mental stress, and spiritual damage. Anger keeps us from developing a spirit pleasing to God. They ask the question, have you ever been proud that you didn't strike out and say what you really had on your mind? You know, you're going to let them have a look. You're going to give them a little taste. Uh, Self-control is good, it goes on to say, but Christ wants us to practice thought control as well. Jesus said that we will be held accountable for even our attitudes. comes from the Life Application Bible. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You ain't killed nobody. You ain't shot no gun, stabbed nobody, beat nobody, clubbed nobody in the head. But, oh, my Lord, have you been on somebody's website? Oh, my Lord, have you killed somebody's reputation? Have you killed somebody's good name? When somebody else had the little gossip circle starting going on, and you know you could have defused that thing, said, listen, it's under the blood. God paid for it at Calvary. And we're going to pray that they're delivered. We're going to ask God to make them better. Or did you start stirring that thing? Yeah, well, you, you, that's what you know. Let me tell you what I know. Do you get an A or do you get an F? Evaluate your behavior. God does not love those who bring people down, destroy them physically, mentally, or spiritually. Does God love the things you do? Does he hate the things you do? Let's go on to the next one. Um, The fourth one on the list that says, God hates a heart that plots evil. He hates a heart that plots evil. The, heart, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, listen to me now. This is what the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? I want to encourage you to be careful. There's a computer uh, phrase that we've said over and over and over again, but I just think it merits being said uh, yet one more time. You ought to be careful because garbage in yields garbage in. Out. You put junk in, junk comes out. And so uh, uh, it's not so much what goes in a man that defiles him, it's what comes a heart that plots evil. So uh, let me ask you a question. Are you planning, premeditating, cohorting with the devil to get into anything evil? Please don't raise your hands. This is not a raise your hand message. I don't want to know your business. Look, I'm going to take my glasses. I don't want to know your business. You, you, you work that out with God. Uh, you, you're good right now because I can't see, can't see you. But I can only see about this far. So you're good right now. Let me tell you something. Let me tell, I can't see my notes. The ideal is, are you planning to do something? Is there a premeditative wrong that you're planning to do? Now, you know what the devil does? He plants inside your minds and says, hey, after the message, we're going to go and we're going to you done did your church thing. You gave, you gave some money in church. You sang the song with the people. You said hallelujah. Now it's our time. Let's go do that thing you like to do. God hates a person that plots, plans, premeditates, schedules out actions of evil. I heard 
I heard a preacher say one time that sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will keep you longer than you planned on staying. Sin will cost you more than you were willing to pay. God hates a heart that plots to do evil. In order not to fail in this area, in order to pass the test and get an A, I want you to apply the verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3 through 6. I left that one for you to read on your own. You can look it up for your own. But if you apply 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3 through 6, you'll get an A against this thing that God hates. You won't, you won't, be, you won't, be, uh, you won't get an A of, of being a, 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 hate, a person who plots evil. You'll be a person who does not, who walks away from evil. Well, time is uh, eluding me as I look at my clock. It says it's ticking away. And so uh, I want to use, I want to connect the two of these things together with uh, some of the things I've already said just so we can move on down the road. Uh, I want to, for time's sake, I want to connect number five, the number five thing that God's hate uh, is uh, with uh, number four, okay? Number five says, feet that race to do wrong. I want to just go ahead and join that up with number four, that a heart that plots to do evil. I do just want to say this. Uh, we need to stop being rubbernecking. Now, come on now. You, you, I, I drive on 75, uh, Lord have mercy, at least five days a week. You ever notice it don't matter what's going on. It could be construction. It could be an accident. It could be a flat tire. It could be two people talking. It could be a new, new restaurant opening up. It don't matter what. You're on 75. You're driving down 75. You're trying to get to work. You done left in enough time to be on time for work. You're driving down 75, and because somebody with a rubber neck want to slow all the way down. If you want to go slow, you should take Central Expressway. Get off the highway. Am I on a soapbox? Let me, get, let me get off this preacher's soapbox. And they slowed down, and now they got, they got traffic backed up way back to why? Because they too busy being nosy all in somebody else's business. Now, it's one thing if you're slowing down. You say, Lord, would you bless them in that accident? I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that that person will come through and that they will come to know you as a result of it. Be with the doctor, dear God. It's one thing if you pray it, right? But if you're slowing down and you got your camera because you're trying to get 15 minutes of fame, I'm just saying, God said he hates feet that are swift to do wrong. We need to stop being troublemakers. We need to stop being instigators. We need to stop trying to stir up things that we have no business stirring up. We, if you're going to run to trouble, run with the gospel. Bring the truth. Bring the light. Bring the answer. Don't bring the drama. These will surely get you an F on the report card of God. Well, Let's go, let's go on down the list. Does God love or hate the things you do? Well, uh, also for time's sake, I want to connect verse 6 with verse 2. I mean, the, uh, the sixth thing that God hates, a false witness who pours out lies with the, uh, the uh, second thing that God hates, the lying tongue. I want to just for time's sake, we could talk about it. You can share a little bit more in your growth group. But I just want to comment that a false witness here points to lies about somebody else. You know, uh, falsely defaming another person's character. Beware of this because this is show enough snake behavior. The Bible said he's called the accuser of the brethren. He wants to accuse you. Say, uh huh, didn't I see? And then ain't that your? Is that your child over there? Did I see? Uh huh. He's the accuser of the brother. The Bible says God hates a false witness who pours out lies. I had to go old school. Uh, uh, Dr. Greg had to go old school. There was, there was an old, old poet that said something like smiling faces. <laughs> Look, I didn't tickle, I didn't tickle, I didn't tickle somebody. Somebody knows somebody. Y'all young folk, y'all don't know. This ain't Jay-Z and them. This is, this is old school. This is going back. Smiling faces. Smiling faces. Uh, sometimes they don't tell the what? Smiling faces. Smiling faces. The poet said, tell lies. And I've got proof. Beware of the handshake that hides the snake. 
I'm telling you, beware of the pat on the back. It just might hold you. Smiling faces. Smiling faces, sometimes they tell lies. They don't tell the truth. God hates a false witness who pours out lies. I'm saving this last one because this is, a, this is a powerful one. Because if you look at the Bible, the way the Bible is reading that, that passage in the, in the Proverbs, it, it gives an X, then an X plus one. I got that from the commentary. I'm not that smart. I'm not that brilliant. But I looked at it. They said X, X plus one. What does that mean? It says it tells you God hates. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then it says, yay, the seventh thing he really hates. And so what it's really encompassing is saying he hates all those things, but that seventh is like the exclamation mark. Bam! He hates this stuff. Okay? Well, what is it? Uh, verse 7 said, a person who sows discord in a family. Oh, my Lord. A person who sows discord in a family. A person who God hates is a person who tries to disrupt unity in his family. The phrase sows discord, paints an agricultural picture of one who destroys a good crop by planting bad seed. The crop is the family of God. The bad seed is anything that divides us. Jealousy, covetousness, gossip, unforgiveness, favoritism, scandal, unfaithfulness, abuse, shaming, and anything else that causes separation in the brotherhood. Do not let the devil use your mouth. Do not let him use your eyes. Don't let him use your hand. Don't let him use your tongue. Don't let him use your attitude to bring discord in the family of God, to bring division in the family of God. If people on this side can't get with people on that side, make sure you check yourself and see that it's not the devil to try to cause division in the family. I'm just telling the truth because if you knew what I knew, if you knew what I knew, you would take it to the cross and say, God, help my brother. God, help my sister. God, help. Galatians chapter 6 says, if you see somebody overtaken in the fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Don't put such a one out on Facebook. God hates a person who sows discord in his family. God sent his son Jesus. Listen to me. God sent his son Jesus to make us one. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that we would be one. Jesus died on the cross that we will be one. He gave us spiritual gifts to bless each other and to unite us together so that we would be one. God does not want his family broken up. Listen to me. John 10, 10, don't be like the devil. You've got to be like Jesus. John 10, 10 said, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is the work of who? Whose work is that? Satan, the devil. Do not be satanic. God hates satanic activity. Listen to me. But Jesus said, I am come that they may have what? Life, and that they may have life more abundantly. You can't have abundant life if you're worried about somebody about to break up the relationship. You've got to allow forgiveness to be in the house. You've got to allow care to be in the house. You've got to allow people to make mistakes in the house and don't beat them down, but bring them up. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. But the Bible said love covers a multitude of sin. Listen to how Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 20, 21. We almost at the end. John, 7, John chapter 17, verse 20, 21. Jesus is praying. He said, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who believe in me through their word, verse 21, that they may all be what? One. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be what? One. In us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is serious about unity. Do not let the enemy use you to sow discord among the brethren. Watch your tongue. Watch your attitude. Watch your actions. Do not let the enemy, you, you are not his child. You are God's child. Well, well, remember the little boy in the, in the video? There's, there's a day when you got to bring 
that report card home, you know, there's going to be uh, uh, an expectation. How did I put that? I, mean, I got to get my own notes out. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a work expectation. Uh -huh. Please don't let your, 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 your presentation be pitiful because there's an evaluation coming. And there's an expectation of your parent, your heavenly father, about how uh, your report card should look. And in fact, what he's looking for is make sure that you have none of those seven things on your report card. You should not walk up to the father saying, here you go. No, no. You, know, you should walk up to the father with the A's because he's given you the power of the Holy Spirit to do everything he has commanded you to do. There is a day of judgment coming. There's a day of examination coming. There is a day where your report card will be reviewed. Don't bring F's in God's house. Don't bring no F's up in God's house. Don't do the things that God hates. Do do the things that God loves. And after you've drawn your last breath here on the earth, there are two statements of Jesus which he could say to a soul in eternity that I want us to beware of. One is very scary. The other is very comforting. Breathe your last breath here. Find yourself in eternity in front of Jesus, the Lord of glory, the King of all kings, the wonderful matchless Savior, the one who died on Calvary's cross, the one who paid such an awesome price to get you into his forever family. Listen, there are two things you can hear Jesus say. Listen, listen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. Some of the most scariest words that I have read out of the mouth of Jesus Christ for me. I'm not saying for you, but for me. Listen to what he says here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. He says this, but I will reply, this is Jesus talking, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's law. The scariest thing, scariest thing I've heard Jesus say in Scripture. But let me, I can't take you down and this has been kind of heavy because I've been talking about, you know, things God hates and all y'all, there's some conviction going on, folks squ squimishing in the chair and all that kind of caring. Even that guy, yeah, I, I, I got I to leave you with something good. Here's one of the greatest things. This is one of the greatest things you want to hear Jesus. When you come with your report card before God, this is what you want to hear Jesus say. Listen to me. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, listen. I long for these words. I want these words. I want my Savior to say these words. I when I'm walking through the gates, I want him ready to say them. I don't want him to say, who is Terry? Let me look at him. Let me see what he. I want him ready to say these words. Listen to me. Listen to me. Here we go. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. He's, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. Willing to give. Willing to live. Willing to share your life for his cause. Good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few. God has not asked you for everything. Give him a few things. You can still go to the fair. You can still shop the sale at the mall. You can still have a good vacation. But can you give God a few things? He said, listen to me, he, you have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of the Lord. There are six things God hates. Yea, one more is a thing that he detests. There's seven things. Are you doing the things that God loves? Are you doing the things that God hates? In your handout, I did a survey and asked some people. I said, can you guys tell me some things that you, you know that God loves? And they're, they're there for you. And I thank you all those people who participated in the survey. I appreciate it. In fact, what I'm going to do, if you're in the city, if you're in the city today, uh, after the message, I'm going to go put a post out on the city. If you're not on the city, get with me. I'll show you how to get on the city. Um, I'll put a post out and say, what is it that God loves? Because I was just so blessed by all the responses. I know more than these people want to respond and talk about what they love. And so, but I want you to get more personal. What does God love about you? Not just what does he love, but what does he love about you? We know that there are seven things, at least, that God hates. I'm sure there are more. But what does God love? Give me my last verse. Do I have it up there, bro? Say these words. Let's say them together. Look on the screen. Look on the screen. Say it with me together. Ready? 
For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eaten. You know what God loves? He loves you. He loves you so much that he went to Calvary's cross to pay the price for all your ugly seven plus sins. All my ugly seven plus sins. The only reason why I can avoid, resist not doing those seven things is because 2,000 years ago, God demonstrated his love for me while I was still a sinner. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary. You see, because nobody's perfect. Everybody's born with a sin nature. Our first father, Adam, made sure of that. And so we come into this world, innocent as we may be looking, we have a sinful nature that must be paid for. But God loved us so much that he emptied the wealth of heaven, the jewel, the crown, the, the Lord of glory, his own beloved. You know, God was good with Jesus. He was all right with it. It wasn't like he said, okay, who, Jesus, you optional. No, you can go, no, it, listen, the Bible said it pleased the Lord to bruise him, who he loved dearly. I mean, this is God from the mountain said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. But he allowed him to go to the cross to die for your sins and for my sins. How, why? Because he wanted you in his forever family. You're not the devil's child. Satan will try to get you to act like him. You're not the devil's child. So if you're doing any of those seven things, stop it. That's devil stuff. That's the devil's baby kids. That's their stuff. We belong to God. Let us walk in the light as he is in light in Jesus' name.